Hey students, uh, this is Professor Gore. Um, this is going to be part one of a two-part lecture on uh, religion and form that takes place in module three um, all the way up to basically the, the American Civil War. So this one, this lecture is going to be a little more complex uh, to understand and so I'm going to spend a little more time and this might be a little bit longer in some areas than it would normally be just to make sure you guys fully understand this. So um, you have basically member from module one, the first great awakening tended kind of to divide churches uh, and it was in direct response to the enlightenment. So the division came from kind of the old lights, and the new lights, uh, new lights use um, intellectual logic to defend Christianity, but also used emotion uh, and worship services and so forth where the old lights kind of were very non-emotional and so forth. Um, and it was kind of the first unifying movement before the American Revolution. The Second Great Awakening, which kind of begins in, at Yale uh, College in the 1790s through actually a prayer meeting, um, kind of progresses. And then you have um, kind of two parts of it. You have the one in the 1820s that uh, or continues into the 1820s. It's kind of more Protestant mainline Christianity. And then the 1830s and 1840s, you end up having that, these fringe groups that kind of splinter off. And so we'll talk about uh, some of those utopian and uh, uh, groups and so forth that will emerge. And so, um, you know, the first great awakening, like I said, was the first unifying movement, but the second great awakening had tremendous social impact more so than the first one. And also tended to uh, focus on emotions more in, in most scenarios uh, than the first great awakening. And so, um, this this emotionalism um, is also going to elevate the status of women. And you're going to see several reform movements that come out of the first Great Awakening that wouldn't have happened in American history um, had the second Great Awakening not occurred. So uh, second Great Awakening does have tremendous social uh, impact. And so that's why we'll spend a lot of time on it, um, just because of its uh, big time effects in, in American history. Um, so one of the things that, that you got to understand about the uh, second Great Awakening is that the a lot of the religious leaders during the second second great awakening argued that you can better yourself um, and you can better those around you and so they wanted to use religious discipline in all phases of life uh, not just in your worship services and so forth and so what you have uh, with the second great awakening is at time complex and at times contradictory depending on which group that you're looking at um, some reformers vowed to improve society by preventing people from behaving in ways that reformers consider dangerous or simply wrong, particularly with alcohol consumption. And so we'll see the temperance or prohibition movement will emerge out of the Second Great Awakening. The religious reformers in the 1820s advocated using their religious discipline to all phases of life. And that means kind of help solve the nation's ills. They champion regular church attendance. And so one of the things that you'll see established uh, that you'll see even carried over to uh, a lot of uh, states, particularly in uh, less urbanized areas and more rural areas, where you'll see a lot of businesses closed on Sunday. Uh, there's even a law in Texas where car dealerships either can be open on Saturdays or they can be open on Sundays. And the reason for that is, is what's called, uh, what's it, kind of these blue laws that, that come about uh, from the Second Great Awakening. They wanted places of business to be closed on Sunday so that it would encourage church attendance. Um, and so we see that carried all the way over in the 2000s. Um, they also advocated for temperance and uh, strict moral codes of the evangelical churches. A second wave of reformers, which emerged in the 1830s and 1840s, which is the second group, was more intent on liberating people from archaic customs and encouraging, uh, encouraging them to de devise new lifestyles. And these are kind of fringe groups that are going to be kind of uh, seen as uh, uh, kind of radical and crazy for the, the majority of religious people uh, at this time. These new reformers were mostly middle class and came from the northern uh, part of the country and also midwestern part of the country, so that old Northwest Territory. They support extreme individualism, common ownership of property, the immediate emancipation of slaves, and sexual equality, which is women's rights. And you'll see the women's rights movement emerge from the Second uh, Great Awakening that probably wouldn't have happened as soon in American history without it. Although their numbers were small, these reformers launched an intellectual and cultural debate that won the attention and often horrified opposition of the majority of Americans. Um, so one of the things that you'll see with Second, second um, Great Awakening is that Protestant Christianity is going to be kind of a social force uh, in American history. And so um, it is going to kind of help shape uh, the American kind of cultural image. 
um, also giving a spiritual definition to American republicanism. So you don't really understand uh, American democracy fully uh, in the first half of the 1800s unless you understand the second uh, phase of the, of, uh, or the second Great Awakening that emerges. Um, also, thousands of African Americans absorbed the faith of white Baptists and Methodists and created a distinctive and powerful institution, the Black Christian Church. So in the first Great Awakening, um, a lot of Southern planters prevented uh, Baptist and Methodist ministers from evangelizing. Evangelize means you're trying to convert somebody to your particular religion. Um, from So they prevented the Baptists and Methodists from evangelizing to uh, uh, African-American slaves. So in the second phase, you don't see that prohibition happen. And so um, you see vast numbers of African slaves end up becoming uh, Christians because um, a lot of them before the second phase of the Dutch Revolution were animistic shamanistic or even Islamic uh, or, or Muslim at that time, I'm sorry. Um, so you'll see that, that this will be a big time change and that's gonna have a tremendous social and religious impact uh, for African Americans in American history. Um, evangelical Christianity also created new roles for women. Women are gonna play a very important role in the Second Great Awakening and then encouraged to take roles uh, in shaping morality for society. And that's going to propel them to eventually advocate for, well, hey, well, then we should have the same legal rights as men. We should have the right to vote. We should have um, property ownership rights the same as men. Um, we should be able to initiate divorce. Only a husband could initiate divorce at that time, which was rare. But um, And then um, also that they uh, uh, should have other legal rights, uh, the same as men, but a right to serve on a jury trial and so forth. Um, so this is going to have a tremendous impact uh, in American history. So how do you solve the nation's problems. Well, according to the Second Great Awakening and these religious reformers, here's how you do it. Well, you need to attend church regularly um, to fellowship with uh, other uh, uh, people that have like-minded religious faith as you. Uh, temperance, re refraining from drinking alcohol. The, the Second Great Awakening, which we'll cover in the second half of this lecture, um, really got people to take pledges uh, to refrain from drinking alcohol. And eventually Maine becomes the first state in American history to ban alcohol uh, sale. And that happens in the 1850s. Um, also st stick to the strict moral codes of evangelical churches. So they wanted people to live a very moral lifestyle uh, and so forth. And another group uh, reforms in the 1830s and 1840s, as I mentioned, uh, kind of encouraged liberation from some of these things. And so it's kind of uh, in response to uh, what they thought as constraining. And some of these had some kind of crazy, uh, uh, at that time was seen as very weird lifestyles. And we'll cover those utopian communities where everybody, you know, you had one where everybody was married to everybody, one that they didn't believe in that you should participate in any kind of uh, natural reproduction. So they only gained new con new people from uh, orphans. Um, so anyway, but we'll talk about each of those. Um, extreme individualism and then common ownership of property. So you eventually have some of these socialistic or communistic utopian communities that emerged that were very radical and, and very much um, a small minority group uh, in American history, but they're still fascinating to talk about in American history. Uh, and also um, you'll see the abolition movement that comes about uh, from the second uh, Great Awakening, which is re really one of the greatest reform movements, if not the best reform movement that comes out because you see this accomplished at the end of the American Civil War with the uh, 13th Amendment being passed in the last few months. Um, also sexual equality, which is women's rights. Uh, this one does not fully get foreseen um, and, and implemented until uh, when we get the right to vote in 1920. All right. So uh, the American Revolution led to a separation of church and state. Um, and I've kind of covered this uh, previously, uh, mentioned this briefly, but Virginia um, and many other colonies when the American Revolution ended did not have religious liberty. And so uh, Thomas Jefferson and the Baptist um, helped establish that. And so what they did is they established a state constitution where you were not required to pay taxes to the Anglican church. And eventually the, um, in 1778, the, the uh, uh, Anglicans living in, the, in the, the American colonies broke away and created the Episcopalian church, which is still around today. Um, and so in New England, they gave them the right, instead of paying taxes to their Congregationalist church, which was the Puritans, um, it still remained the official state church for several years afterwards. Uh, but you at least have the, the right to pay taxes to your own local church nomination. So, but you did have to pay taxes to a particular church. And so that'll eventually change. Um, eventually, one of the things that gets established at the local level is tax exemption for uh, what was very common for churches. 
And so that's one of the things that you'll see continue all the way to the 2000s uh, in American history is that uh, religious institutions and nonprofits um, still remain uh, tax exempt uh, at the making of this lecture. So, um, and most the Protestants are going to demand religious liberty. And uh, that's, that's significant, even though they're going to pass a lot of local laws that, that prevent, you know, try to prevent business from being open on Sunday. They still wanted people to be able to worship as they chose. Uh, now, at times, you'll see that there will be persecution and exceptions to that. For instance, the Mormons uh, get persecuted of have, having to flee to the western states into present-day Utah to avoid some of this persecution because they, um, particularly uh, a lot of local communities, did not like uh, the practice of polygamy, having multiple wives. Okay. So what exactly was the Second Great Awakening? Um, it's, it's important to understand it is very much a religious movement, but it's also a social movement. So you, I would recommend you highlight that or write that down in your notes. It's a social and religious movement. And so that, that's one thing you definitely need to understand um, is that it is both because it has social reform movements that we'll cover in the, the latter half of this lecture that come about as a result of this. Um, and so one thing, though, that the, the First Great Awakening doesn't kind of throw out the intellectual side of religious faith with Christianity. But the second phase, our second great awakening actually kind of does like they almost like uh, celebrated um, kind of, I don't know if you call it ignorance, but just, Oh, it's okay. If you're not seminary educated, as long as you have an emotional faith through God, then, then they glorified that instead. And so um, that's a big transition uh, in American history and particularly in religious history in the United States. Um, and so they, they did think that you can't fully achieve perfection, um, but that you can try to be perfect. You can also try to perfect society around you. And that's where these reform movements come out. And so it is a social and religious movement at the same time. Um, and, and one of the things you'll see is that just like the first Great Awakening leads to return a church attendance, you'll see the second Great Awakening will do the same. Um, and we've talked about uh, some of these social ills that they'll want to try to reform. We will see that take place um, at um, um, in the latter lecture that basically covers like the temperance movement, the abolitionist movement, uh, prison and sane asylum reform, women's rights and so forth. Um, so who does it not affect? Well, it doesn't affect the Catholic churches. Um, it does not affect the Episcopal churches. Now the three denominations that it does affect are the Presbyterians, the Baptists and the Methodists. And so uh, with the Presbyterian Church, it attracted more members in part because its members elected laymen to uh, their local synods and the church congregation and the church uh, congresses determined doctrine and practice. Now, the two biggest groups that grow the most from Second Great Awakening are uh, evangelical Methodist and Baptist churches um, as they became the most popular. The Baptists boasted a Republican church organization with self-governing congregations. In common with the Methodists, they developed an egalitarian religious culture marked by communal singing and emotional services. One region of New York became known as the Burned Over District, and I'll cover that a little bit later as well, uh, just because of all the converts that emerged along the Erie Canal. The movement did, however, surprisingly widen the lines between the classes and, and regions. The First Great Awakening, like I said, split many churches, um, while the Second Great Awakening tended to strengthen them. So what was the Burned Over District? Um, it was a part um, of Western New York, and this was this area was settled after the uh, American Revolution when the Iroquois um, give up their Western New York land claims in the, in the Treaty of Fort Stanwix, and allow them to move to Canada or assimilate as, as somewhat into to some of the New York population. Um, and so, when the Erie Canal gets constructed, you have all these towns that spring up. In fact, uh, um, a lot of the New York population outside New York City all lives within 25 miles of the Erie Canal. That's how much important it is to economic growth and jobs. And so. Um, there was these, some of these towns that, that, had, that were swept so much by the Second Great Awakening that historians called it the Burned Over District, a wildfire of new religions. And in this region, you're going to have the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints that's, that's founded. You're going to have Seventh-day Adventists um, and, and so forth. And this is also where Charles Grandison Feeney primarily uh, preached at. And so who was Charles Grandison Feeney? Uh, he was actually a Presbyterian minister, uh, but unlike... Other Presbyterian ministers, he used a lot more emotions uh, in his sermons. Like he would um, um, advertise when he was getting ready to come speak in an area for a few weeks in, in advance. Uh, people that he that they in the town were known not to be converts. He would get uh, local volunteers to get them to sit on the front row 
and he would directly preach to them. Uh, and so he would put a lot of emotional uh, uh, fervor and, and get them to try to convert. Um, he was born poor, but ended up rising to middle class ranks before going on an, an intense con conversion experience that led him to uh, uh, being the Presbyterian minister that he was. Beginning in towns along the Erie Canal, the young minister conducted emotional revival meetings that stressed conversion rather than instruction and discipline. So unlike a lot of Presbyterian ministers, he does emphasize uh, emotion in his uh, sermons and this emotional faith that emerges. This greatly accelerated Second Great Awakening. The doctrine of free will was particularly attractive to members of the new middle class who had already chosen to improve their material lives. Finney had great success converting the poor as well as the rich, so he was able to appeal to a variety of economic classes. His most spectacular triumph came in 1830 when he moved his revivals from small towns to Rochester, New York, now our major milling and commercial sale on the Erie Canals. This is in the heart of the burnt over district. Preaching every day for six months and promoting group prayer meetings in, in family homes, he won over the influential merchants and manufacturers of Rochester who pledged to reform their lives and those of their workers. They promised to attend church, give up intoxicated beverages of alcohol, uh, and work very hard. Converts began founding churches. Finney's wife, Lydia, and other women carried the message to the wives of the unconverted. They also set up Sunday schools for the poor children and formed the Female Charitable Society to assist the unemployed. Certain occupations ignored Finney's message, such as well as like the Irish immigrants. They were primarily Roman Catholic. Nevertheless, Finney's revivals worked quite well, as one part of the New York was called, the, as I mentioned, the Burned Over District. And uh, the revival swept uh, from Western New York through Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Indiana. So those are the states that primarily felt these emotional revivals, uh, if that makes sense. And one of the things you'll see is that now Finney stayed in one region, but a lot of these ministers would travel by horseback from town to town, and they would establish churches, and they would appoint influential uh, families that were um, uh, staunch converts to kind of help run the church. Um, and so, but Grant, Charles Grant, if you might remember, he was the most uh, influential of the ministers of the of Second Great Awakening, much like Jonathan Edwards. And, and really, if you want to compare him to George Whitfield of the First Great Awakening. So you can read this as well, some of the things he did. Um, and so, like as I told you, he put some of the people he knew that were known uh, sinners uh, in the town on the front row and would pray with them by name. And uh, one of the things though that, that Grant Safini did do that that uh, helped influence the, the women's rights movement is he encouraged women to testify in public about their faith, um, as well as lead prayer meetings and, and form these uh, kind of missionary and uh, charitable societies. So in a way, Grant Safini helped elevate the status of women um, in, in his areas. And this, this is a cool picture uh, because now, what you would have, because it, just like the first Great Awakening affects a lot of the frontier areas, Second Great Awakening does the same thing. And so what you would have is, is in between the planting and the harvest time, um, you'd have uh, people from surrounding countrysides would come to these what's called tent meetings. Now, they weren't always in a tent. And you can see from this, this, this uh, drawn picture. But what they would be in kind of these rural countrysides it was a religious um, uh, event, but also was a social event as well, because what they would do is they would listen to preaching off and on throughout the day. They would have these huge potlucks. People would camp out kind of under the stars or under wagons or under tents. Um, and it was a big social gathering. In fact, uh, uh, several people uh, throughout this time also met their future spouses at these events. And uh, so it, it, it is a, you got to remember if these people are isolated in these rural farming communities, this is a big social gathering as well as a religious gathering. Um, so it was a big deal, and it did attract uh, you know hundreds and, and thousands of people uh, to these these uh, revival meetings. And so this is a, a, a painting of people getting emotional in the pews uh, at one of these tent revival meetings in the burned over district and so forth. And people are 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 uh, discussing themselves for their their uh, wrongdoings that the minister is is talking about in this image. So uh, it is broader than the First Great Awakening, and uh, uh, Baptists and Methodists evangelized in the cities and in the backcountry, where the, the First Great Awakening did, didn't affect the cities as much, more so as affect the rural areas. This one affects both. Um, one of the things that emerges as well is the Universalist. And so it's, it's kind of a new sect, um, kind of this idea that everybody is going to heaven, uh, so to speak. It's a new, uh, they kind of repudiated the Calvinist doctrine of, of predestination and preach universal salvation. They did gain thousands of converts, especially in Massachusetts and northern New England. Um, 
And after 1800, enthusiastic camp meetings swept the frontier regions of uh, South Carolina, Tennessee, Ohio, and Kentucky. The largest of these tent revival meetings, and th these are not universalists, these are just like Baptist or Methodist um, tent meetings or camp meetings, as they were called, was actually at Cane Ridge, Kentucky in 1801. Um, and so... Basically, the Second Great Awakening changed the denominational makeup of American religion. The most important church of the colonial period, the Congregation of Episcopalians and Quakers, grew slowly from the natural increase of their members. But the Baptists and Methodists grew tremendously from just new converts. Um, and that's why they, they sprung up so quickly. In the rural South and West, ministers rode horseback as circuit ministers and uh, visiting existing congregations on a regular schedule. Um, and so they established these new churches, as I mentioned, and then you would have uh, uh, the most devout families would, would end up leading these local churches. It's pretty cool if you ever get a chance to go to Smoky Mountain National Park um, and visit some of the, the local uh, these uh, churches that have been preserved. Uh, they're really neat. You kind of get an idea of what these small rural community churches look like. Uh, Smoky Mountain National Park is the most visited national park in the country every year. Uh, if you don't get a chance to see it, I, I highly recommend you, you, it's a beautiful area and some of these churches are preserved in Cates Cove, but just just driving through it, you'll be you'll be at all by the national park. There's a reason why nine million people go to it every year. You can see right here um, from this map, you can see where Cane Ridge is right in the middle and these uh, religious revivals kind of emerge. And so Cane Ridge attracted people from uh, a few different states. You can see along the Erie Canal on this map where uh, the burned over district is as people are migrating west. And so uh, the further west you go, that's tend to be more later um, revival meeting because more and more people are settling that further west because of the cheap availability of land. All right. So one of the things that, that's pretty cool is the black um, um, churches that emerge. And these are going to be significant because you'll see a lot of uh, the abolitionist movement come out of this. That's what I, what I was talking about being cool is that it, it's, uh, it kind of helps bring a, a voice for free um, African-Americans living in the U.S. Uh, in the early part of the 1800s. And so um, it, and some historians call it, and this is a quote, a central and defining event in the development of Afro-Christianity. Um, so in the South, evangelical religion was initially disruptive for us because it spoke of spiritual equality and criticized slavery. That's why in the First Great Awakening, uh, these uh, plantation owners didn't want uh, Baptist and Methodist ministers to evangelize. Unfortunately, some ministers altered their message in order to not offend. Husbands and planters grew angry when their wives became more assertive and when blacks were welcomed into their congregations. Other evangelists ignored the objections of slave owners and carried the teachings of Protestant Christianity to enslaved African-Americans. In fact, you'll see some uh, a lot of the um, uh, abolitionist leaders in the North will be ministers. Uh, before this, the Second Great Awakening, most blacks preserved their religions from Africa. Then the mid-1780s, Protestant evangelists uh, converted hundreds of African-Americans along the James River, Virginia, and throughout the Chesapeake region. And so we'll cover this in a later lecture, but a lot of these, these uh, slaves that were in, along the James River in Virginia and the Chesapeake region, they end up getting sold what they call down rivers, just further down into the deep south when cotton plantations were beginning to take off. And so they took their, their new Christianity, uh, the religious faith, with them as they went. Um, so, uh, one of the things you'll see is that black preachers adapted the teachings of white Protestant churches to meet their own needs. Black Christians generally ignore the doctrines of original sin and Calvinist predestination, as well as biblical passages that encourage unthinking obedience to authority. Some African American converts envision the Christian God as a warrior who liberated the Jews from Egypt. So they always compare themselves to the, the Jews that were enslaved in Egypt. If you ever cover world, take World History One, they, uh, we talk about that. Many of them look forward to emancipation from slavery seen throughout throughout Scripture in the Bible. Okay, um, so this will be established um, during the Second Great Awakening, and uh, um, one of the, one of the kind of unique um, African American Christian domination American history is called the African Methodist Episcopal Church (AME). Um, and so it's one of the largest um, African-American Christian denominations in the country today. So uh, now one of the things that you'll see besides universalism is what's called Unitarianism, also popular in New England. And uh, what, what exactly were this? These were New Englanders who rejected the Calvinist uh, preoccupation with human depravity and weakness that the old Puritans or the Congregationalist Church had taught. And they embraced doctrines that focus on human ability and free will. They placed emphasis on the power of human reason. They discarded the concept of the Trinity so that God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, 
Other New England Congregationalists reinterpreted Calvinist doctrine by abandoning predestination in favor of all men and women being able to choose God. <clears throat> so Unitarianists and Universalists, I'm not as familiar uh, with, with both of them. Um, Universalists do advocate that universal salvation, everybody's going to heaven. Unitarianists kind of believe that, uh, but they definitely denounce Calvinism that God predestined some to go to heaven and some to go to hell. Um, Lyman Beecher and others advocated um, some of this Unitarianist thinking, uh, but they weren't full Unitarianists. From the awakening, pious merchants in New York founded the Human Society and other charitable organizations. And by the 1820s, so many devout Protestant men and women had embraced benevolent reform that conservative church leaders warned them not to neglect spiritual matters. Still, improving society was a key element of the new religious thought. Unlike the First Great Awakening, which split churches into warring factions, Second Great Awakening fostered cooperations among denominations. Religious leaders founded five interdenominational societies. Okay. This is an example of a universalist church, by the way. So here's some examples of the interdenominational society. These are Christian Protestant denominations working together. So you have the American Education Society, the Bible Society, the Sunday School Union, the Tract Society, and the Home Missionary Society. And so what these, these groups typically did is, is they would kind of join forces to help evangelize, and they would kind of raise money to send out uh, ministers to kind of like missionaries, so to speak, missionaries. They were have uh, taken world history. We talk about that, that uh, Islam, Christianity, Buddhism are very evangelistic. They would send out like missionaries to go evangelize. Um, and so you see that uh, happening and they would, they would print these like tracts, so to speak, to be handed out to, to try to get people to convert to Christianity. Although based in Eastern cities like New York, Boston, and Philadelphia, these societies minister to national congregations, dispatching hundreds of missionaries to Western regions and distributing tens of thousands of religious pamphlets. Increasingly, Protestant ministers and lay people saw themselves as part of a united religious movement that could change the course of history. So that's where you see this blending of religious and a social movement taking place in the Second Great Awakening. I can't understate that because you, you can't understand the Second Great Awakening unless you understand the social significance. And these are four movements that come out of it. They, they truly believed that they could uh, advance and improve society uh, through the use of, of, of Christianity. Um, and so... One of the things that you'll see is that this enthusiasm um, for religion becomes a, really a, a force in political life as well. Um, they urge reform not only at the moral level, but also the use of politics to pass laws um, to ban alcohol consumption or to pass laws that would uh, try to hopefully get women the right to vote, which happens more so after the American Civil War. All right, let's talk about women's uh, new religious roles. And so uh, women um, are going to demonstrate their own piety, in which piety means like very moral behavior. Uh, and so women are actually going to be the, uh, the, the founder of some new sects, that, uh, that's S-E-C-T-S, uh, that emerged. One of them is Mother Anne Lee, who organized the Shakers in Great Britain and then attracted recruits for, uh, when she came to America. You also had Jemima Wilkinson, who, be, who began a sect in Rhode Island after hearing George Whitfield preach. Her sect eventually dwindled away. So you had two women that actually founded these, these different religious sects that, that emerged. Um, also, women started numerous Christian charities and organizations to help orphans, widows, education, African-Americans, and many others. Women took charge of religious and charitable enterprises, that both because they excluded from other public roles and because ministers relied increasingly on them to do the work of the church. After 1800, more than 70% of Congregationalist churches were comprised of females. And you even see that in the 2000s, that the majority of um, Christian churches today, they're, over 50% of them are going to be made up of women. Um, this led to ministers having co-ed prayer meetings, where, where in early decades they were separated based on one's gender. So men and women actually prayed together in the second grade awakening. When the first grade awakening, you'd have men prayer, male prayer meetings and, and female prayer meetings. More couples wait until marriage to have sexual intercourse from the second grade awakening as well. Some church congregations, however, were not as enthusiastic about women by preventing them from voting in church uh, matters. So not every church congregation was, hey, women should be elevated and so forth, but, but many were. Nevertheless, mothers throughout the U.S. founded maternal associations to encourage, encourage Christian child raising or rearing. And by the 1820s, Mother's Magazine and other newsletters widely read in hundreds of small towns and villages were given, uh, giving women a sense of shared purpose and identity. Um, and so one of the things that you see emerge is women's education. And this is big 
because like in the 2000s, uh, women actually make up uh, over 50 percent of university um, students. And so uh, for a long time, education was dominated by men. But how do we get from uh, where almost all people going to school are men um, at, at the college and, um, and, and graduate level to now majority women? Well, it starts a segregated awakening. So they found a specific seminaries that were female seminaries and female colleges and universities to educate women. And also one of the things you see emerge is that um, the majority of teachers are going to be female. Um, and so my mom taught first grade for 35 years. My sister is a speech pathologist in the school district. Uh, and so you will see that um, the majority of, of teachers today or 50 percent are women. Now, there's still men in education. I was uh, I'm an educator and I'm a male. But um, but you see um, a lot more female school teachers that, that come about. And that's because of the second grade awakening because it encourages them to take a greater role. Uh, Emma Willard opened up the Middlebury uh, Female Seminary in Vermont in 1814. Many of these educated women replaced males as school teachers. And because women had a uh, few other opportunities for paid employment, they would accept lower pay for men. So a lot of times these small rural towns, they would hire women teachers because they could pay them less. That's terrible about the wage gap, but uh, um, it's a part of American history that happened and, and it happened in the early 1800s. Um, Basically, this is kind of, I think, fascinating is that female school teachers earn from about 12 to $14 a month, but they would get room and board um, included uh, 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 with that. So they would get free, usually housing, uh, along with 12 to $14 a month. And that was less than farm labor, which is terrible. But as school teachers, women had acknowledged, a play, had acknowledged places in public life, a goal that had been beyond their reach in colonial revolutionary times. Just as the ideology of democratic republicanism had expanding voting rights and the political influence of ordinary men in the North, so the values of Christian republicanism had bolstered the public authority of middling women. The Second Great Awakening made Americans a fervent Protestant people. Um, along with the values of republicanism and capitalism, this religious impulse formed the core of an emerging national identity. And we'll start that part um, for this first lecture dealing with uh, religion and uh, reform and second great awakening. We'll hit part two here shortly.